All right, good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. My name is Andrea Cornell, and I am the Public Policy Program Assistant at Genetic Alliance. I want to welcome you to this Coalition for Genetic Fairness and Genetic Alliance webinar on the implementation of the employment provisions, or Title II, of the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Today's program was largely inspired by the February 25, 2009 release of a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking from the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission. The proposed regulation applies to Title II of GINA, which is the portion of the law that protects individuals from genetic information discrimination in employment settings. With the release of the proposed regulation for Title II of GINA, the EEOC opened a 60-day comment period that allows the public to provide input on both the proposed rule and any of the issues related to the proposal. So during today's program, Susanna Baruch, Law and Policy Director of the Genetics and Public Policy Center, and Jeremy Gruber, President and Executive Director of the Council for Responsible Genetics, will present model comments crafted in response to the EEOC Notice of Proposed Rulemaking. Through this process, they will discuss the protections afforded by GINA and greatly illuminate areas of confusion and issues that require additional attention as we move toward implementing this landmark law. Susanna will begin the webinar with a discussion of the important definitions within GINA, as well as the interaction between Title I and Title II, among other topics. Jeremy will then discuss more specific issues addressed in the model comments. We will have ample time at the end of the program for questions and answers from the group. I'm very happy to provide you with this timely and educational webinar on such an exciting issue. With that, I will turn it over to Susanna to begin our discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Andrea. Um, hello, everybody. I want to thank the Genetic Alliance for putting this webinar together. Um, as most of you probably already know, we are in the middle of a long process of getting the regulations related to the Genetic Information on Discrimination Act in place. Um, the uh, last time that we did a webinar with the Genetic Alliance, it was to discuss a request for information that the agencies regulating the health insurance portion of GINA were putting uh, together. Uh, the, the RFI was um, an effort to get information together that would then go into a rule from those agencies. Um, today we are talking about Title II of GINA. Um, as Andrea said, the EEOC has actually already issued a notice of proposed rulemaking, which is essentially a draft rule. Um, that lays out the regulations for employers to follow in complying with GINA. So what Jeremy and I are going to do is talk through the draft comments that we have put together. These are comments um, <clears throat> which other organizations and individuals are welcome to use as the basis of their own comments. We encourage everybody who's interested in this topic to submit comments. Um, the draft comments are available uh, on the Genetic Alliance website. They're also available on the Genetics and Public Policy Center website, which is dnapolicy.org. Um, and any questions that don't get answered today, feel free to email me um, or Jeremy with questions uh, directly. We will be putting together the final version of these comments for our own submission um, by May 1st, which is the deadline. So with that, um, I want to talk on the first slide about the sort of three main areas of the uh, proposed rule where we think some additional attention needs to be paid. Uh, you know, to back up for a minute, I think it's fair to say that there are many areas of the uh, proposed rule where we are very pleased with the approach that EEOC took, um, a very thoughtful and thorough approach, which basically takes GINA and applies other areas of employment law and sort of vice versa. So GINA makes some changes to some areas of employment law. Um, GINA is also consistent with other areas of employment law. And the EEOC has done a good job of sort of digging in to figure out where there are new issues that need to be addressed in this proposed rule. The three areas that we emphasize in our proposed, um, in our draft comments are uh, the need for uh, an emphasis on strong and unambiguous definitions of some of the key terms in the law, which are new terms um, for those dealing with in, in employment law, um, terms like genetic information, genetic test, which I'll get into in a minute. These are not new issues to many of you. Um, we had debates about them throughout the 
fights over getting GINA passed, and we have, as you also may know, continued to talk about the importance of these terms and these definitions throughout discussions with the uh, health insurance regulating federal agencies. So um, this may be a review for some of you, but we are emphasizing these issues with EEOC as well. Um, Jeremy is going to talk about some issues related to the prohibition on employers requesting and requiring genetic information and the exceptions to that prohibition, um, which gets into really the nitty gritty of where genetic testing pops up in employment. Um, so Jeremy will be handling that as well as talking about the need that we see for additional clarity on what's commonly known as the firewall. Um, uh, a, a provision in GINA which basically says that Title I and Title II claims have to be separated. So I'm going to let Jeremy handle those um, after I walk through the definition. On this, on this next slide, I want you to ignore the word underwriting, which should not appear there. That's a, my error. Um, underwriting was an issue in definitions for the Title I regs, but not for the Title II regs. But the definitions in GINA um, historically have been sort of problematic for policymakers to grapple with. And so uh, some of our um, primary recommendations are that the agencies need to include specific examples of what are and are not um, considered uh, genetic tests. The definition of genetic information, we feel, needs to include any genetic information no matter when it was discovered or obtained. So, <clears throat> genetic information that an employer may learn about that was done um, uh, before the employee came to that particular job or um, even done uh, before birth in the case of prenatal testing um, that might be in the employee's medical record. We want, it, we want the regulation to make sure um, and be explicit that all genetic information um, is covered no matter when it was obtained. Other than that one clarification, uh, I think that the definition that the agency uses to describe what genetic information is um, is, is quite complete. Uh, it includes um, genetic information that comes from the manifestation of a disease or a disorder in a family member um, and talks a little bit about what a family member is. Uh, any family history as opposed to a genetic test result is also included. So to, to talk about genetic tests for a moment, again, I think it's fair to say EEOC shows a good understanding of where we think the genetic test definition lines need to be drawn. Um, the definition in Title II has one explicit exception to genetic a genetic test. In general, a genetic test means an analysis of human DNA, RNA, chromosomes, proteins, or metabolites to detect genotypes, mutations, or chromosomal changes. There is an exception um, that states that the genetic test doesn't include proteins or metabolites that do not detect genotypes, mutations, or chromosomal changes, but we actually think that's more or less a restatement of what the rule itself um, states rather than an actual exception that carves out any genetic tests. The GINA regulation does include some explicit examples of what is and is not a genetic test, and we think that EEOC uh, got it right in their, um, it, to the extent that they lay out some examples of tests such as BRCA variants, um, Huntington's disease mutations. Um, there are some examples offered <clears throat> of tests that are not genetic tests, such as viruses, tests for viruses, tests for drugs or alcohol that uh, do not test for a genetic propensity, but simply test for the use of drugs or alcohol um, or infectious disease uh, transmitted through food handling. These are all examples of not what would not be a genetic test. In our draft comments, we offer a more a, a lengthier list of um, tests that would be protected under the definition and encourage EEOC to include our examples as well. To move on to the next slide, it's interesting to note that the concept of manifest disease doesn't really appear in Title II, but they have seen it as important to define what a manifest disease uh, is. The basic idea behind GINA um, is that a genetic 
uh, test result is not a disease and therefore is treated um, not as a disease that, that could be uh, medical information rather than genetic information. Um, and, and I realize that's a little bit unclear. The, the, the issue here is that we, we want to be clear that a, that a disease or a disorder or a diagnosis based principally on a genetic test should not be an exception to the definition of genetic information. So put another way, um, as it is put in the preamble, the mere presence of a genetic variant detected by a genetic test doesn't mean that that condition, disease or disorder is present. In the context of employment law, if a disease, disorder, or condition is present with signs or symptoms, um, the Americans with Disabilities Act um, in most cases would provide the law for to what extent an employer could or couldn't um, take that condition into account. Um, and finally, on, on the last slide, to talk a minute about the definition of genetic services, I think that the law itself actually is pretty clear. It explicitly includes testing, um, genetic testing, genetic counseling, and genetic education. The issue that we've tried to emphasize is that genetic services ought to include the services that people seek out on the basis of a genetic test that reveals that they're at an increased risk for a particular disease. <clears throat> While it's not explicit in the law, it is absolutely in the motivation behind GINA that patients need to feel able to pursue preventive care based on their genetic test results. And they should not have to fear that there will be discrimination on the basis of seeking those, that preventive care. Um, so that's an issue that comes up both in Title I, where health insurers would have information about people's preventive care, and employment, where an employer might also have that information. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy to shift gears and talk about some of the employment law-related uh, aspects of this rule. Thank you, Susanna. As Susanna uh, said, um, uh, in terms of the uh, EEOC's uh, administration of, of Title II, they've already issued an NPRM, and that's largely the result of the fact that the EEOC, as compared to the agencies um, that administer Title I, has been intimately involved uh, with GINA uh, for many years. The EEOC played a major role, for example, in drafting President Clinton's executive order uh, on uh, genetic discrimination for federal, uh, protecting federal employees from genetic uh, discrimination. So their background, uh, they've also testified in Congress uh, during the GINA process, so their background uh, on GINA is far more extensive um, than some of the agencies administering Title I uh, is, and as a result, uh, I think we see a, a, a relatively well-constructed uh, NPRM. There are uh, some issues, though, uh, that could potentially be significant uh, that we address in our comments, and I, in particular, uh, address the majority of my comments um, to the uh, acquisition of genetic information section of Title II. Um, uh, what, I'd, what I'd like to start first, though, and this, this will uh, refer back to some of my more substantive comments on uh, the acquisition of genetic information section of Title II, and that has to do uh, with some of the language uh, that the EEOC uses in the preamble uh, to, uh, to the MPRM. In the preamble, as it's uh, currently um, written, it states that in, with regard to uh, the acquisition of genetic information, Title II restricts the deliberate acquisition of genetic information um, by employers or other covered entities. Uh, the, what we uh, attempt to do um, in our uh, comments is to, uh, is to nuance uh, this language, because what Title II does, uh, uh, was meant to do was not simply to uh, prohibit the deliberate acquisition of information. It was 
um, meant to prohibit intentional acts. Uh, the difference being 